Warner Brothers sued the makers of today's movie because they thought it stole too much from The Exorcist. It's enough to make your head spin. Welcome to Sick Flicks, where I take a deep dive into the cinematic sewer to help you embrace your inner gore geek. I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, and today we're talking about Ovidio Asinidis' demonic possession film, Beyond the Door. Released in 1974, Beyond the Door is often labeled as an exorcist ripoff. Although to be fair, the film feels as much like Rosemary's Baby and The Omen as it does Friedkin's horror classic. It's worth noting that Warner Brothers wasn't suing claiming the film's stories were the same, but instead that Beyond the Door infringed on the character of Reagan and the cinematic effects in the film, notably the demonic voice, levitation, projectile puking, and so on. Kinda crazy Warner Brothers hasn't basically tried to sue every demonic possession film since on the same grounds. At any rate, the case was settled in 1979. The film was not pulled from theaters, but as far as I can tell, Warner Brothers was paid some money. It's a pretty interesting case. But hey, this is sick flicks, not Law and Order. You just want to know if Beyond the Door is splattery. Let's get to the gore and find out. Oh, and before we get started, today's video is sponsored by patrons Brian Mills, James Gent, and Gutan Clan. You know what they say, the Gutan Clan ain't nothing to fuck with. If you'd like to sponsor some videos, swing by my Patreon page and sign up. You'll find a link in the pinned comment and the description below. Now that we've got that taken care of, let's get rolling. We fade in on these creepy candles in this weird voiceover narration. Although there was a time when I was always being painted or impersonated in one way or another. If that voice sounds familiar, it's because it's allegedly Edmund Purdom, previously seen on sick flicks as the Dean in Pieces and the priest hunting down Luigi Montefiore in Absurd. And as weird as this is, things are about to get weirder. Here's budget Olivia Newton-John, ready to get physical, and a naked lady whose head basically morphs into Ian Anderson from Jethro Tull. Do you kids even remember Jethro Tull? Christ, I'm old. And yeah, gotta work around the boobs or old prude tube will demonetize me. Even Olivia Newton-John is freaked out by this. Then we jump over here to Richard Johnson making his second Sick Flicks appearance. We last saw him in Fulci Zombie. Satan's not happy with him. Dimitri, why did you let her get away? And he drives off this cliff. You could say that one way or another he's gonna get to the bottom of this. And that it's a real cliffhanger. Basically, Satan lays out his plan here. He'll give Richard Johnson more life if Richard Johnson brings him the girl from earlier and her unborn baby. If you succeed in ripping it out of that woman, maybe I'll let you live for a few more years. Then we rock into the credits. So, we've got a naked woman with a man's face and this rockin' band. I have no clue how these things fit together. I'm sure it'll all make sense eventually, though. And the credits roll on. I had a case of asinitis once. Was in the middle of heavy squats after eating Taco Bell. Look, it's Juliette Mills. She's Haley Mills' sister, and it's sort of amazing they got her to be in this movie. And Gabriele Lavia. We last saw him in Deep Red. So, this is what Barry White sounded like before they auto-tuned him and turned up the bass. Tonight I stand on the edge of eternity, where she left me in the darkness of despair. Um, is that kid drinking soup with a straw? Young Andy Warhol was weird. Ah oh, yeah, the 70s, when you just threw the kids in the back of the convertible with no seatbelts or car seats or anything. If they die, they die. Man, this track is getting funky. Could use a little more wackacha though. Special effects supervised by Wally Gentleman. That sounds made up, but Wally actually worked with Kubrick. He made some of the model spaceships for 2001. Back at the studio, Robert gives some feedback. It's too dead. It's got about as much balls as a castrated jellyfish. Do jellyfish even have balls? Look at this guy. He's like, this white dude's gonna tell me how to play funk. When the revolution comes, I'm killing you first. We then jump over to Safeway. Man, she doesn't make the kids wear seatbelts and she just leaves them in the open convertible while she goes shopping. The 70s were lit, guys. Better pick up some flowers for the kid's funeral. With my parenting skills, they'll be dead any day now. These really are the funkiest opening credits ever, though. How is Bargain with the Devil not a huge hit? Oh, oh, Directed by O. Hellman and Robert Barrett. The O. Hellman is just a video Asinidas trying to convince you he's totally American. Meanwhile, Robert's still not happy. It stinks. Sounds like a jerk-off session in the bathroom. Man, he's really sort of obsessed with male genitalia, castrated jellyfish, and now bathroom wank sessions. You guys sound like you're more interested in choking your chicken than bringing me the funk. If you could play your instruments as well as you play with your tools, 
It might sound a bit better. See? On the drive home, we get to meet the kids. They're delightful. Holy shit, Ken, did you get a load of that crap? I can tell you this, if I talked like that as a kid in front of my parents, I'd be wearing dentures now because I'd have no teeth left. Hey, remember that crazy nickname you gave him? What was it? Asshole. But the kid's not wrong. Robert is kind of an asshole. If I'd ever thought a thing like that, I certainly wouldn't have married you. Back at home, Jessica has news. I think the time has come to prepare the den for the third Barrett. Look at Robert. He's like, are you sure it's mine? And he's thinking I'm going to have to make a bargain with the devil to afford a bigger place in San Francisco. Yeah, he's really not taking it well. Great, another foul mouth to feed. Might be time to go buy a pack of smokes. That night, Jessica vanishes during the party. Oh, honey, it's okay. I get sick to my stomach thinking about having another kid too. Oh, wait, that's not why you're puking? My bad. Afterwards, young Saddam Hussein is peeping on her. And the next day, she heads over to see Dr. Fletch. So, how long have you been pregnant, Mrs. Barber? That's Babar. Two Bs? One. B-A-B-A-R. That's two Bs. Yeah, but not right next to each other. Wait a minute, I thought this was my joke. He's got interesting news. She's more pregnant than she thought. The results of your tests show that you're pregnant all right. Not by seven weeks, though, but by three months. Then she has lunch with Robert. Wait, is she drinking champagne? Jessica's really pushing hard for Mother of the Year. Maybe she can smoke a carton of cigarettes later. Back at home, she's doing a little scrapbooking when she finds this picture of her and Richard Johnson. Then she freaks out and destroys Robert's aquarium. Say what you will, but this is some vicious behavior. She calls Robert to tell him and is like, I did it. I killed your fish. I'm guilty. Later that night, it sounds like someone here has sleep apnea. Better get them a CPAP. Then she starts floating across the house. I've heard of being light on your feet, but this is ridiculous. The next day, Robert and Dr. Fletch meet for lunch. Don't worry, he put it on the Underhills tab. They're not enjoying the beluga in private, though. Richard Johnson is spying on them. I wonder if I could get a couple of steak sandwiches and put them on the Underhills tab, too. Anyway, Dr. Fletch is here to drop this bombshell. That the development of the fetus is proceeding with absolutely incredible speed. Wait, are you telling me I don't even have nine months till this hellspawn is born? Gonna have to speed up my escape plan. Then we head over for some girl talk. I don't know, he's changed. He's become strange lately. Yeah, he's become strange, says the woman levitating across the bedroom. The next day, Jessica gives Gail a taste of her pimp hand. Pregnant woman mood swings are real. Back at Dr. Fletch's, she's like, do you own rubber gloves? And he's like, I rent them. I have a lease with an option to buy. Man, I sure hope you guys have seen Fletch. And if you haven't, go see Fletch. She's here telling Dr. Fletch she doesn't want to have this baby. George, I want an abortion. I don't want to have this child. Then this happens. Filthy murderer. This is my child. Mine, do you hear? I'll never let you kill it. See? Mood swings. Hello? Records room? It's me, Dr. Rosenpenis. I'm gonna need Jessica's file. Oh, and the Beatles' White Album. Later, she's walking around when she stops to eat this rotten banana peel. This doesn't look very appealing. Later that night, it basically turns into the pod people. Trumpy, you can do stupid things. The funny part of all this is this is San Francisco. It's just your standard Tuesday earthquake. And then Gail runs to wake up mom. Jessica's like, God, kid, you're a real pain in the neck. This is basically where Warner Brothers won their lawsuit claiming this was an exorcist ripoff. Although to be fair, the effect looked cooler in Friedkin's movie. Robert comes home to cranky Jessica and says what we're all thinking. I don't understand you sometimes, Jessica. The next day, Robert heads out for a walk, but Richard Johnson is following him. He's trying to give him the slip and walks right in front of this rider truck. Dude's about to have a moving experience. But Richard Johnson saves the day. After some jibber jabber, we get this hilariously framed shot. Way to make Robert look like he's three feet tall. At any rate, it's good to see that you could still be accosted by crazy people on the streets of San Francisco even back in the 70s. Robert, there are certain people who are the prey of negative forces. Back at home, Jessica's on bed rest, but her lazy eye is acting up again. It's sad, really. She never looks forward to anything. Later that night, Dr. Fletch is at her bedside, but Jessica's okay because she's doing her best Roger Daltrey impression. Who are you? 
who, who, who. Then she starts saying mean things. The Chevy Chase show sucked. Don't look now, but she's got the morning sickness again. It's really fascinating to see Juliette Mills in demon form. This was pretty far beyond her regular roles, and she says she loved the part. Dimitri, Dimitri, come on, Dimitri. And this budget Mercedes McCambridge voice, coupled with the green vomit, probably helped Warner Brothers' case a lot. Then we get this plot reveal. Dimitri, I'm waiting for you. You know I am. This feels like it should be more important than it really is. <laughs> Just in case you forgot who he was, here's some random footage of him walking around. A young Saddam Hussein enjoys life in the city by the bay. The next day, he shows up at their house. Did I ever tell you I was almost James Bond? He's in here making demands like he owns the place. No one takes her away, you understand that? No one! She stays here! Don't make me use my license to kill, Robert. Jessica's life is in your hands. Her life is in your hands, dude. And now he's getting a little alone time. Hell yeah. No, not like that, you pervs. Although he is sort of making out with himself. In his rush to get away, he walks right through the film's rhythm section. Hey man, we're recording the soundtrack. You shouldn't be here. Um, is that dude playing the flute thing with his nose? I know they asked him to put some boogie into this track, but this is way too literal. I will say this though, he's really rocking out. His performance is pretty flamboyant. I know, I know, these booger jokes are snot very good. I'll try to pick better ones next time. Then Dr. Fletch meets him in the parking lot, probably working on a new piece of investigative journalism finding out about the drug trade down at the beach. Robert's like, I'm taking advice from Richard Johnson now, Dr. Fletch. I'm sorry, I trust the advice of a random guy off the street more than you so-called medical professionals. You must be kidding. Oh no, I never kid. Then Robert's like, Buenos dias, Tierra del Fuego. Will I run out of Fletch jokes before the end of this video? Not a chance. And back at the house, Jessica's in a straitjacket. That seems totally reasonable. And they're gonna hook her up for a brain scan. Not gonna lie, this wire management needs some work. Fletch is flummoxed by these results. Jessica shows absolutely no cerebral activity. Robert's like, I've been trying to tell you that for years. Then she starts channeling her inner Edmund Purdom. The child must be born. It's also worth noting here that there are lots of weird freeze frame shots in this film. So many that you'll think your disc is defective. That's not the case. It was a deliberate stylistic choice, although it is kind of weird. Later on, Robert makes the classic rookie mistake of undoing the straight jacket. <laughs> Way to go, Robert. She starts tossing him around and it's like a Lionel Richie video in here because he's dancing on the ceiling. Dimitri's like, told ya. While that's going on, Dr. Fletch heads down to the water to check for Fat Sam, but he just finds Budget Shirley MacLaine instead. She gives him the lowdown on Dimitri. He talked a lot about things. About those things that you don't believe in. Things like Helter Skelter. Wait, that was Charlie. I mix up my kooky cultists in this town sometimes. But she does drop this bombshell. He died many years ago. Although really, we already kind of knew this from the car crash at the start of the movie. Back at the apartment, the devil is taunting Dimitri. It's time. It's time. Would you like a little more time? It's like he doesn't really care if he gets this baby or not at this point. Over in the other room, Jessica's looking great. All that stuff they say about the glow of a pregnant woman, totally true. At any rate, she's clearly been working out because she rips right out of this straight jacket like she's Scott Steiner. <laughs> then she starts floating. <laughs> Say what you will about Jessica, but she's really not very down to earth. And this is apparently so Dimitri can get a better angle to deliver this hell spawn. I've never delivered a baby, but I'm pretty sure this is not how it works. And then she Ralph's green slime on him. <laughs> he didn't even say I don't know. The bad news for Dimitri is the green slime is probably never coming out of that suit. The worst news is the devil has been lying to him all along. Did you really think I would save your miserable life? <laughs> then Jessica drops the name of her next black metal album. Nobody knows the exquisite suffering of the damned. I approve. After that, he starts beating on her belly like it's a bongo and he's auditioning for the Bargain with the Devil band. Life, 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 life. If Robert were here, he'd be like, no, no, remember, you've got a quarter note rest in there. I thought you knew how to play the bongos. And with that, Dimitri apparently dies and goes to hell. <laughs> the 
Yeah, your guess is as good as mine. Dr. Fletch shows up to find Jessica looking healthy and normal. And this baby, who has a great future as the lead in an adaptation of Harlan Ellison's I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream. Well, I mean beyond it being dead. Fletch is like, look, a defenseless baby. And now everything's great. Jessica's not possessed, Robert doesn't have another mouth to feed, everything's coming up Millhouse. Except I feel a swerve ending coming on. Oh yeah, wait for it. Ken's possessed. What's the moral of this story? When you let your kids curse and call you by your first name, you're opening the door for the devil. Take that, hippies. It really is sort of wild that Warner Brothers won a lawsuit because they felt like this was too much like The Exorcist. I mean, every other exorcism movie in history has used the things they sued over. The court case was a bit of a double-edged sword, too. Warner Brothers didn't succeed in getting beyond the door yanked from theaters. The controversy, meanwhile, sparked interest in the film. Interest that might not have existed otherwise. At any rate, this is an exorcist riff in the sense that it's about demonic possession and all that, but like many of the Italian pastiches over the years, it's really its own thing. And it's nowhere near as good as Friedkin's classic film. There's not a single kill in this movie, which is weird, but I wanted to highlight this even though it's not gory because it is historically interesting, especially if you're into demonic possession movies. Can Beyond the Door earn any barf bags? Let's go to the gore card! In terms of gross anatomy, Beyond the Door is light. As mentioned, there are no kills in this movie. There's one popped out eyeball that looks passable, and Juliet Mills' demonic makeup, but that's about it. Mills was reportedly not a huge fan of the makeup as it took hours to get on and off and sometimes tore her skin. It's not as extreme as Reagan's transformation in The Exorcist, but it's not bad either. The demonic makeup work alone is enough to earn this one a barf bag. This is definitely not a sick flick, but it is an example of why Italian horror is fun. It's kooky and wild and weird. Want to see a gorier movie where people get possessed by demons? Then be sure to check out my review of Demons 2. You'll find a link here on the screen after my hours of outtakes. I'll meet you over there. Until next time, I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, bringing you all the splatter that matters. I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, and today we're tackling... Already off to a great start. It's always a good sign that the video is going to be great when you can't even get the intro right. Kind of crazy that Warner Brothers hasn't basically tried to sue every demonic pos blah, 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 blah. For a guy who went to college, you think I'd be better at reading. Previously seen on sick flicks as the Dean in pieces and the priest hunting down. Priests. Priests. And the priests. You know, the priests. It's like a Toyota car. Breathe in. Breathe out. Back at Dr. Fletch's. Fletch's. Back at Dr. Fletch's. This is the glamorous life of being a YouTuber. Back at Dr. Fletch... Fletch... Why can't I say Fletch now? Man, I sure hope you guys have seen Fletch. Ooh. Must be going through puberty again. Later that night... It, oh my god, what is with my throat? I must have been smoking a carton myself. This was pretty far beyond her nor, 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 normal roles. Good stuff. This is pretty far beyond her nor, her normal roles. It really shouldn't be that hard to say. Her nor her I can't even say it trying to Fuck. <laughs> this really is the worst recording session ever. Robert's like, I'm taking advice from Richard Doc. Oh my god, why why do I like read at a second grade level? I will say this though, he's really rocking out. His performance is pretty flamboyant. <laughs> flamboyant. Oh my god. This was pretty far beyond her normal no. We don't pay you to talk, Mike. We just pay you to stand here and look pretty and have a nice beard. 